Jabonani. Jabonani. This sketch, called Shibonini, was published in 1855 by Lawrence Oliphant, former civil secretary and superintendent general of Indian Affairs in Canada. We are looking toward the west end of the channel. George Island is on the left side of the sketch. On the right, on the mainland, is De La Mirandier's trading post and part of the village of Shibonini. Ani and good day. My name is Adele Lusmore and I'm a Treaty Indian from Shibonini. My community is located at the entrance to the North Channel on Georgian Bay. I've placed a white dot on the map below me to show where we are located. In this video, we're going to look at what outsiders said about our community. These are just little snapshots in time, but I think they show that across many decades, visitors consistently thought our community was a First Nations settlement. Our First Nations ancestors are Ojibwe, Odawa and Potawatomi. But the Métis Nation of Ontario and the province of Ontario decided to change their ethnic identity to Métis. They did this by distorting some parts of the historic record and ignoring other parts of it. This manipulation of our ethnic identity is deeply disrespectful to our ancestors and our community, and it violates the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. This series of videos was created to show you that their claims are not supported by the historic record. The black dotted line on this map shows that during the 1760s, Shibonining was on the main trade route that wound its way all around the Great Lakes and into what later became the United States. I added a yellow triangle to show the location of Shibonini. Alexander Henry, born in 1739, was a fur trader and a partner in the Northwest Fur Company. In 1809, he published a book of his travels a version of which was later published in 1901. Henry's reference to Shibonining is from a trip in 1760 and says, We coasted along many small islands, or rather rocks, of more or less extent, either wholly bare or very scantily covered with scrub pine trees. All the land to the northward is of the same description, as high as Jabonining, where verdure reappears. There's a footnote after the word Jabonining, and it states, Jabonining, the name of the village now known as Killarney. This is a sketch of Anna Jameson. She was born in Ireland in 1794. And she wrote a book about her experiences in Toronto and her trip to Sault Ste. Marie and back in 1837. She had this to say about her overnight stay in Shibonini. About sunset, we came to the hut of a fur trader, whose name, I think, was Le Mirandier. It was on the shore of a beautiful channel running between the mainland and a large island. On a neighboring point, Wei Sawindabe, the Yellowhead, and his people were building their wigwams for the night. The appearance was most picturesque, particularly when the campfires were lighted and the night came on. 
I cannot forget the figure of a squaw as she stood dark and tall against the red flames, bending over a great black kettle, her blanket trailing behind her, her hair streaming on the night breeze. We were off the next morning by daylight, the Yellowhead's people discharging their rifles in salute. If you have been watching my videos, you know this sketch very well by now. It's from a book by the former Deputy Superintendent General of Indian Affairs, Lawrence Oliphant. That's his picture on the left. What you might not know is what he wrote about Shabonining in 1855. In his book, he said, we coasted along the shore of the mainland and reached the Indian village of Chabonining, composed of wigwams and containing about 400 inhabitants. It is situated upon a narrow channel about a mile long and scarcely 200 yards in width, which divides a group of rocky and picturesque islands from the mainland, here rising to a height of about 1,200 feet above the lake. As we entered this channel, with the Indian village in the foreground, the effect was very striking, and as we steamed away from it, it became a matter of much curiosity to me how we were ever to find our way out of these intricate waters. It wasn't long after steamers began traveling the lakes that excursions became a very popular pastime. This ad is for the steamer Plowboy. You could go from Collingwood to Killarney or Little Current for $7.50 if you wanted a cabin. Or you could travel second class for $4.50. The tourist industry that is still so important to our economy got its start in the 1860s. And one of the reasons that people were so interested in Killarney is because they could see Indians here, up close. In one book, the author said, at communities where the steamers docked, tourists took the opportunity to examine native life firsthand. One Globe reporter described, how when the orange men of York and Simcoe reached Killarney in 1865, the excursionists thronged the street, the Indian wigwams were entered, and conversation by means of sign language was carried on with the older women who had stayed home to mind the babies, each snug in its tikkanagan or cradleboard. I'm sure lots of people remember this image from school history lessons. It's called the last spike. The driving in of that spike in November 1885 represented the completion of the transcontinental Canadian Pacific Railway. A director of the company, Donald Smith, was the person who drove in that spike. Standing behind Smith and a little to his left was Sanford Fleming. He was a surveyor, a railway construction engineer, and one of the CPR's directors. Over 10 years earlier, in 1872, as chief engineer of the Pacific Railway, Sanford Fleming traveled along a possible route for the expansion of the railway system to British Columbia. His expedition came through Shabonining. Reverend George Monroe Grant, who traveled with Fleming, described their arrival as follows. The entrance to the strait has been called Killarney. According to our absurd custom of discarding the musical expressive Indian names, for ridiculously inappropriate European ones. Killarney is a little Indian settlement, 
with one or two Irish families to whom the place appears to owe very little more than its name. The Canadian Illustrated News of 1873 said doing the lakes is now recognized as the proper thing for pleasure seekers during the summer. Two steamers in particular, the Chicora and the Francis Smith, were singled out as the finest of the Collingwood and Lake Superior Royal Mail line because of superior accommodations and speed. Chicora, pictured here, was described as the largest and fastest steamer on the route. The Francis Smith, shown in this photo at the dock in Collingwood, was a 182 foot long side wheeler that was built in Owen Sound in 1867. She was expected to outdo the Chicora for speed once her planned alterations were finished. Both steamers traveled between Collingwood and Thunder Bay and made regular stops at lots of smaller communities along the way, including Killarney. In 1874, a passenger wrote a letter to a newspaper called the Renfrew Mercury about his trip on the Francis Smith. This is what he said about Killarney. The houses are chiefly wigwams, made of poles collected at a point at the top and spread out at the bottom, and covered with mats woven of rushes. The inhabitants profess the Roman Catholic religion and speak the French language. They gathered in great numbers on the shore as we approached, attracted by the music of the band, and appeared to enjoy it immensely. And then a completely different type of visitor arrived in Killarney. Lord Dufferin, the Governor General of Canada, visited Killarney in 1874. His wife, Lady Dufferin, traveled with him and kept a diary, which she later published under the name My Canadian Journal. This is what she had to say about our community. We went into Killarney, the Indian name of this place signifies here is a channel, and sailed up very narrow passages to reach it. The Indians were collected on the wharf, and one of them made a speech to His Excellency, stopping at the end of each sentence to have it translated into English. Dee's reply went through the same process. We spoke to the women and distributed knives, pipes, tobacco, and beads. This watercolor by Frederick Arthur Werner is called Indian Encampment on the Shore of a Lake. It's on the website of an art auctioneer in Toronto, a company called Cowley Abbott. I'm not going to tell you that it's a scene from somewhere around Shabonany. I'm showing this to you because a newspaper reporter of 1878 commented in a story that the scene visitors see when they arrive here is very much like the settings in Werner's paintings of Indian life. A short run brings us to Killarney on the mainland, a wild, picturesque looking village situated in a valley flanked and backed by high rocky hills dotted with innumerable Indian wigwams. Toronto visitors will at once see where Mr. Werner caught his inspiration for the many characteristic Indian pieces which figure at the art exhibitions on King Street West. The village, what there is of it, is built on the north side of a deep, narrow strait and consists of several stores, a little Roman Catholic church, and a small sprinkling of houses. The population, we are told, is about 200, 
composed largely of Indians and half-breeds. Here's part of a brochure from the 1878 Northern Railway of Canada, showing their railway and steamer connections across the Great Lakes. One of the Traveler and Sportsman's Guidebooks, published in 1880, described Killarney like this. Leaving Owen Sound Harbor at night, the steamer passes into Georgian Bay again and after eight hours run, passes the Lonely Island Lighthouse and arrives at Killarney, formerly called the Sawananing, or a channel, a village inhabited chiefly by Indian fishermen who bring in large quantities of whitefish and salmon trout from Georgian Bay, which are here salted and shipped to Toronto. the Superintendent General of Indian Affairs, in the Department's 1883 annual report, referred to several bands of Chippewa Indians on the north shore of Lake Huron and listed the locations of their reserves. The red arrow is pointing to the last reserve on the list, right after Whitefish River and Point Grandine, Jabonining. The Great Northern Transit Company's brochure said that the little village of Killarney is the first stopping place on the North Shore. The population here is largely Aboriginal, and like their white neighbours, the Indians derive a considerable portion of their support from fishing. In this photo is the steamer Majestic in the Killarney Channel. She was built in 1895, 209 feet long by 35 feet and 1,578 tons. She was owned by the Great Northern Transit Company. The year before Majestic was built, this description of Killarney appeared in the Globe newspaper. We spent half an hour or more at Killarney, that pretty little Indian village with an Irish name. And as usual, a brisk trade was done there in the sale of Indian work of birch bark and sweetgrass. William Lyon Mackenzie King, later to become Prime Minister of Canada, also traveled through the area in 1894. He wrote in his diary, We stopped at Killarney. I was more struck with this place than any other on the trip. The population here are largely Aborigines, and you see when sailing into the port, the Indian huts upon the banks, and the Indians and their families lying lazily around the outside. It is indeed a very pretty sight. This map by the Geological Survey of Canada shows part of Lamoranger's Bay and Rutherford Township on the left and part of Collins Inlet and Philip Edward Island on the right. Almost in the center of this section of the map is Chickenishing. The map also shows the trail coming from Shabonining to Chickenishing as well as the one going from Chickenishing to George Lake. Both of these locations were settlements populated by our families for many years before the federal government acknowledged one of them on this map. I put a red circle at Chickenishing around the label that the government gave it. They called it Tyson's Indian Village. Years later, the Ontario government bullied and threatened our families out of their homes at George Lake and at Chickenishing when they wanted to establish Killarney Provincial Park. I'll be talking more about that in another video.
Back in 1897, the federal government's map clearly acknowledged our First Nations families who lived in their settlement at Chickenishing. In the early 1900s, birth registrations for our ancestors were recorded on a two-page form like the one shown on the screen. The first page recorded the baby's name in the left column, then the date of birth, name of father, name of mother, place of birth, etc., etc. On this form from 1906 are the names of several of our ancestors. All of the fathers are listed as fishermen of Killarney. At the top, there's Catherine LaBelle, whose father was Albert LaBelle and mother was Philemon Solomon. Charles W. Pitfield, Wilbert, his father was George Pitfield and his mother was Marguerite de la Mirandier. There's Joseph Richard Solomon, son of Frank Solomon and Louise de la Mirandier. And Alphonse Rock, son of William Rock and Mary Jane Solomon. The person who signed the forms and submitted them to government was C. L. D. Sims. He was the Indian superintendent at Manitowani from 1899 to 1911. He knew the people of Killarney and he certainly knew where Killarney was. He came here numerous times to pay out treaty annuities. So here's what I find interesting about his use of the forms. The first page said District of Manitoulin. That's not surprising. But the title on the second page said Division of Indian Reserves. There are several years of birth registrations for our ancestors that are filled out the same way. Years ago, when I was doing a lot of genealogical research through the Ontario archives, one of their staff told me that whenever I made a request for vital statistics records, I should be sure to mention that the data for our ancestors is in the Indian records section because that's a separate collection. At least it was at that time. The Ontario archives also today has an Indian genealogical collection that includes Killarney. The Government of Ontario has continued to claim that Killarney is part of a historic Métis community, despite all of the evidence, including the data in their own Ontario Vital Statistics Office and the Ontario Archives, which shows that our ancestors were members of a historic First Nations community. Sims also identified Killarney people as Indians in his role as Indian agent. He noted in a 1908 expense report that he was here on July 18th, paying Indians their treaty money. In 1912, his successor, Indian agent McLeod, wrote a letter to Frank Rock of Killarney saying, I intend being at Killarney on Friday the 13th instant to distribute Robinson Treaty annuity. Will you kindly let the Indians know so that they will be on hand? This map shows the areas in which Native and non-Native people lived around 1830. The pink section is where Native people were concentrated. Non-native settlements were in the white part of this map. I put a black dot on it to mark the location of Shibonining in Ojibwe territory. In 1830, Etienne de la Mirandier's trading post had been in operation there for 10 years.
According to historian Helen Tanner, in about 1830, the Potawatomi were living around the lower part of Lake Michigan. They shared the western shore of that lake with the Ojibwe and the Odawa. The Potawatomi ceded their lands under several treaties. One required them to vacate their lands by 1838. Some of them moved west of the Mississippi River. Others refused to leave. Some who left returned to their homes, saying that the land they were expected to settle on was swampy and had no game. In 1838, the U.S. government wanted to move all Indians west of the Mississippi. The military was sent in to drive the Potawatomis out. Some of the people ran away and later escaped into what would become Canada. Many others would be escorted on a forced march from Indiana to Kansas, which is known today as the Trail of Death. Because their members had been widely scattered, many people did not receive their share of annuity monies that had been promised to them under various treaties. In 1906, the United States Congress ordered that an effort be made to try to identify and locate the Potawatomi people and their descendants who were owed those treaty monies. In 1907, the U.S. Commissioner of Indian Affairs assigned the job of finding the Potawatomi people to W.M. Wooster, and the results of his work would come to be called the Wooster Roll. The Canadian Department of Indian Affairs took over efforts to have the monies paid out by the U.S. government, asking that anything owed to the Canadian branch of the Potawatomis of Wisconsin be turned over to the department who would then manage the funds. In a report dated 1919, Indian Affairs noted that the representative for the U.S. Secretary of the Interior visited Indian communities at the following places in the province of Ontario. I underlined that part in red on this image. They named the village of Killarney as one of them. I put a red rectangle around the name so it's easier to spot. That visit to Killarney didn't happen by accident. Someone in Canada's Department of Indian Affairs would have provided a list of communities that had or were likely to have descendants of the Potawatomis of Wisconsin. This is another example of Indian Affairs referring to our village as an Indian community. More than 60 people of Shibonining were included on Wooster's role. They were descendants of Mrs. Philemon Prue, also known as Marianne, Ningwawanons, Pakwajikwe, Sloakijikokwe, de Chicagong. Chicagong was the indigenous name for Chicago. So she might have lived for a time at Chicago but other documents say she was born at Green Bay, Wisconsin. Medway Kmekanang, Mrs. Tranche Montagna Sr., was also Potawatomi. She is a foremother of all the Pilons of Killarney, but it seems that she was not part of the Canadian branch. Her Pilon descendants are not listed on the Wooster Roll. I'll be talking more about both of these families in a different video. In 1918, the Wooster Roll began to be called the Chisholm Roll, after the lawyer who updated the list of names. The department noted in its 1918 petition to the United States government that the list of people was accurate and complete, and that the department recognizes them as Indians, 
and supervises them accordingly. Indian Affairs reviewed the role again in 1922. Killarney descendants of Marianne Ningguanans were named on these lists every time they were updated. A Jesuit named Thomas Campbell wrote this book, tracing the history of the Jesuits from 1534 to 1921. This is part of what he wrote in a chapter titled Modern Missions. Anyone who has visited the Abenakis at Old Town in Maine, or La Jeune Lorette in Quebec, or Conewaga on the St. Lawrence, or the Indian settlements at Waquemacong and Killarney on Lake Huron, will testify to the excellent results of the teachings implanted in their hearts by the old Jesuit missionaries who reclaimed them from savagery. In a 1923 letter to Indian Agent Daly at Perry Sound, the Department of Indian Affairs approves of his proposed trip to Killarney to take the Indian census. He is also reminded to pay the Killarney Indians any interest money that is due them, and that he should obtain as much information as he can about the said Indians. This steamer was named Georgian, and it was stopping regularly in Killarney in the 1930s. Around the same time, the Detroit Sunday Times advertised what they called a mystery contest. The headline on this clipping reads, Times winner will see this. That person would receive a three-day trip on the SS Georgian. And when it stopped in Killarney, he or she might see this very scene, which the Times described as an Indian lad carrying water with an old yoke. So even into the 1930s, our community was still regarded as a place where visitors could see Indians and see them doing unusual things like using a neck yoke to carry water. The young boy in this photo is Franklin Prue, probably on his way to or from the channel, where a lot of people went for their water supply for many years. As you have just seen, a whole bunch of outsiders, like Indian Affairs officials, reporters, travelers, Jesuits, all kinds of people, described our community as an Indian settlement. Next time, let's take a closer look at who our ancestors thought they were. What did they have to say? <laughs>